Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to read a little bit of Ruth Montgomery. Ruth Montgomery was one of the country's most respected and widely read authors, whose A World Beyond was hailed by the critics as dramatic evidence of continuing life on the other side of the door called death. You'll remember that we've covered Ruth Montgomery previously in an episode on walk-ins, which was incredibly fascinating discussing this idea of star seeds and walk-ins. She had a very unique writing style. She would automatically write on her typewriter. She would communicate with guides and she had a personal friend that had died that came back and also spoke to her and she tried to translate everything they said. These guides would love to talk about creation and the prehistory of the earth. I wanted to share some passages from the book, The World Before, which is absolutely fascinating, discussing Lemuria and Atlantis and Mu and a lot of other places in our prehistory, and even going into a discussion of the angels. And here I'm just capturing a couple chapters, one on in the beginning and another on those biblical angels. I think you'll enjoy both. They're very powerful. She begins by saying nearly every school child can quote the best known verse of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But where did the world come from? And what was there before the beginning? The guides declare that until there was only a void too deep for human comprehension, not even chaos existed, they say, because there was no sound, no vacuum, no stillness, and no sleep. The time for awakening was a time of deep, Yet the force that we call God was always, for without God there is no thing, no motion, not even a nothingness. Because of my innately curious nature, honed by several decades as a newspaper writer, I prodded them to explain where this force originated. And the guides frankly replied, We are unable to answer that for this reason. Until the creation of human souls, there was no Akashic records, not even a soul remembrance until God set the planets into orbit, creating motion and harmony, we souls were merely part of the whole, without animation or awareness. But this force was. God is. Of that we are certain. This much we can tell you, that from out of the fastness arose a mighty force, an intelligence so all-knowing and all-wise, that it is beyond conscious understanding. This force began to move, and as ideas formed in the mighty being, they became deeds. From molecules and atoms thought into being by this force came specks and particles that gradually melded together and began spinning in space. And as direction was given to these revolving masses, there gradually evolved planets which swung into predestined orbits around suns of magnetic force. Thus began the firmament, and as conditions became ripe on some of the planets, Minute forms of life appeared, first propagating by simple fissure, and gradually through more sophisticated methods such as egg and sperm and fetus. So intricate and exciting became the system of growth that the force we call God desired companionship to share his joy, and in a mighty burst he cast off trillions of sparks from his exalted being, each spark a soul who traveled happily alongside him, exploring the world of his creativity. Many, through their worshipful devotion, became true companions to him, of whom all were a part. But as each explored, in his own manner some fell by the wayside, curious to know how they too might act as gods, for since they were parts of the whole, they possessed creativity and free will. My mysterious guides tell a weird and wonderful story about the creation of souls, the warring of angels the habitation of the earth by various creatures, and the eventual advent of man in human form after some spirits had willfully entered the bodies of beasts, fish, and fowl. Their account would seem highly fanciful were it not corroborated in many details by such eminent psychics as Edgar Cayce, the seer of Virginia Beach, Johannes Grieber, a Catholic priest in Germany, and numerous others. According to the guides, all of us began simultaneously in that original burst of sparks. No new souls have been created since, and many of them have never entered a physical body. I asked if it were true that Lucifer did battle with other angels for God's kingdom, 
as described by Father Grieber in communication with the spirit world, and they replied in the affirmative, saying, It was near the dawn of the age when spirits had been created in the likeness of God, beginning as tiny sparks who gradually took the form of miniature gods. We spirits, we were like unto him as a toddler is like unto the parent, and equally innocent of willful wrongdoing. We were miniatures of the Creator, and adoration filled us for this mighty being who had given us a separate life from himself. Then some souls began to stray away like naughty children will do, testing their own strength and acting without the directive force of God. Jealousies arose, and although all sparks began as equals, some gradually became more powerful beams than others. Even as children with the same parents will vary in their aptitudes, ambitions, and abilities. Thus Lucifer became a foremost spirit as did the Christ who, because of his special devotion, was nearest and dearest to the Creator. Lucifer represented this closeness as Judas was later to do with the disciples, for jealousy ever threatens even when there is no cause for it. Another day in discussing the creation of the universe, the guides wrote, There were many cataclysms during the period that molten earth was gradually solidifying. At first there was gaseous material, then water, and as land emerged in solid state, rumblings, sinking, swellings, and cracklings occurred. But the land finally began to flower, and the waters to attract algae and simple forms of marine life, for the energies expended by the mighty force saw to it that all was fertile to maintain forms of life. These were already established in other planetary systems, and now the good green earth became the home of all manner of life forms, each adapted to its own purpose. These had at first been inanimate, but as the energy entered in each began operating according to its divine pattern. The trees producing nuts, fruits, and exotic patterns against the sky and the bushes and shrubs bearing delectable edibles or flowers, each according to its plan. Next came the animal kingdom, and when the souls cast off as sparks from the energy force known as God saw these wondrous happenings, they too sought to enter into the plan. At first they were content to share with God the pleasure of his experimentation with the galaxies and the various type of life evolving on the more hospitable planets. But on earth some of the creatures of sea, air, and land had gradually progressed to noble specimen, and by experimentation the souls discovered they could enter into those bodies at will, coming and going as they pleased. Some of these curious souls experienced the thrill of eating berries, fruits, and nuts for a time, and then withdrew to spirit form, leaving the animals unmolested. Others so greatly enjoyed the experience of procreating, eating, and sleeping, they became entrapped and were unable to leave the gross physical bodies. Then jealousies arose over mating principles, and greed entered into their consciousness as some found better grazing lands and fruits, or infringed on territories already staked out by other once pure souls, who through idle curiosity had also become entrapped in human bodies. It was thus that the force we call God decided to form, first in thought, then in matter, a superior creature with hands and feet and sturdy upright bones, with a mind larger in proportion to the body, who could distinguish good from evil, and could control the beasts and birds and fish through superior intellect. At first all went well, but since free will had been given them, these new beings began engaging in intercourse with those tormented souls who had entered into animal bodies and distortions of the perfect pattern for man occurred. Their misshapen offspring had partly human bodies with such appendages as cloven hooves, tails, horns, fins, or feathers. It was a forlorn example of willful disobedience to God, and these beings who once roamed the earth are still remembered as centaurs, unicorns, satyrs, mermaids, and nymphs. Some are depicted in the tombs of ancient Egypt and elsewhere as part humans with horns, claws, wings, and other unnatural appendages. Even the prehistoric sphinx near Cairo has an animal's body with the face of a man. These beings would not be regarded as mythological, they were real. Remember that the original sin was cohabiting with animals. Thus we see man gradually evolving, while often reverting to animalism. Even today, occasional throwbacks are born with weird appendages carried by genes of those misguided ones. Granted that such cases are sometimes reported in the press, I still could not understand why the earliest humans should have sought sexual relationships with beasts or birds and fish until the guides, in their methodical way, commenced a daily session by explaining. In the beginning, each soul was androgynous, having both negative and positive forces even as does God himself. A soul was able to dwell in a body as long as it wished, going and coming at will for thousands of years, so that there was no need for propagation. 
But after some became entrapped in gross bodies by engaging in intercourse with animals, it was necessary to devise a system where humans could procreate their kind and thereby satisfy the aroused sexual urges. Thus a soul entering physical body was divided, each a half of the whole, and until physical death releases our souls, we ever remain lonely halves in search of fulfillment, which comes only in spirit when we are rejoined. Amelius, the first soul to occupy perfect human form, was a total whole, as were the others who knew the earth in light bodies. But with the return of Amelius as Adam, he was two parts, both Adam and Eve, and as time passed, each half developed separate habits of thought and deed. Rereading this passage after the morning session, I was surprised to note that my unseen informants had identified the first soul on earth by the same name Edgar Casey had assigned him, except that in Casey's readings it's spelled Amelius. Since Casey's utterances were given orally and my guides continued thereafter to spell it Amelius, I am abiding by their choice. I was also intrigued by the guide's assertion that Amelius returned as both Adam and Eve, having recently read The First Sex by Elizabeth Gould Davis, who said women were the original leaders and were intended for that role. I asked for clarification, and they wrote, Women were immensely important in the early days on earth, as they are today, for they are blessed with our creative force of the universe and are therefore nearer to our creator than those who have the seed but are helpless to propagate without the womb of woman. She it is who carries the egg to be fertilized and who gives of her own body to bring forth the temple for another soul to occupy. We inheritors of the Judeo-Christian ethic have been primed since babyhood on the biblical story of Adam and Eve, the serpent and the forbidden fruit. But the guides say that of this allegory, Eve was no more a temptress than Adam. Moses, reputed author of Genesis, added that flourish to keep women in a lowly place in the Jewish hierarchy. For the so-called curse of Eve, menstruation and childbearing was the highest blessing the Creator could bestow on his beloved souls, the power of co-creating life with himself. Small enough price to pay for such a signal honor, for did not God give something of himself to create the souls of all of us? And since each of us returns to earth again and again, sometimes as man and other times as woman, the honor is not received for any one class of souls, but for all of us to have that achievement of co-producing life. Another day, the guides continued their dissertation on the so-called war between the sexes, writing, Remember that women were as active as men in producing the wonders of an ancient age, for there was no differentiation between the sexes, and each was half of the whole. God himself is totally whole, being neither male nor female. And the only reason Jesus spoke of God as our Father was to confirm to the customs of the times. In the Semitic race, man was the head of the household, and women were often treated like chattel. Yet look at the wondrous women depicted in the Old and New Testaments. The Hebrew males were chauvinists, many of them bigoted, narrow, and full of self-aggrandizement. Too bad, but eventually the pendulum will swing back, and women will again take her rightful place on the equality with man. Remember that each of us has at times been man and woman, so we are not casting a stone at any particular group of souls. The Garden of Eden, according to the guides, was a figurative place located on no particular landmass as the entire earth in Adam and Eve days was green and verdant without ugliness or barrenness. The snake was merely a symbol for the kundalini, the creative power which lies coiled like a serpent at the base of the spine until awakened. And the forbidden fruit was the opening of the seven chakras, the psychic centers or the ductless glands. Too suddenly, with the stress on the gonads, the earthly center, rather than on the pineal, the Christ center, and the pituitary, the master gland or god force. The beginnings of man on earth represented an achievement of monumental proportions, the guides say, for not only was he superior in mind and body to all other creatures, but was inhabited by the Spirit of God, and having been given free will, he was able to arrive at decisions after reasoning, something totally alien to the animal kingdom. He was permitted to choose his own course, to love and even to hate, for as a segment of God he could create thought patterns and project them into reality. Truly a marvelous advancement over the herd instinct of those created before him. Thus, man became individual, yet he was part of the wondrous whole, and to admit of dislike or contempt for another human being is to hate oneself and the Creator. Each of us is a part of the original whole and will ever be fragmented until the day comes when all are united in God. 
The guides for several years have been dictating material for a book about creation, but I could not bring myself to work on the manuscript. Lily, Arthur, and group seemed puzzled by my unaccustomed lack of industry until one morning before the regular session I typed this message to them. I feel that we do not have enough original material because what you have told me is similar to what Edgar Casey and other psychics have provided. Calmly and dispassionately, the guides replied, Now that we understand your reasoning, let us say that all sources with access to the acoustic records will naturally report the same truths. Edgar Casey correctly reported that Amelius was the first of the angels who came in human form as a thought pattern. And after he proved able to function in the earth, others came. As Casey and we have told you, some souls defiled the perfect plan by procreation with animals so that monstrosities were produced and this continued for many millennia. But remember this, after human souls were separated into male and female so that they could produce their own kind, God imposed divine laws, making it impossible for human beings to produce offspring as a result of cohabitation with any other species. Five races of humans simultaneously entered the earth, each developing different pigmentation to cope with the varying rays of the sun and color to harmonize with his environment. Amelius returned as Adam and Eve, hoping to demonstrate that spirit could live in physical body without greed or envy, reigning over the animal and mineral kingdoms in perfect harmony. In this way, the earth was peopled. These spirits in human body were able to communicate with each other by thought, or what you nowadays would call ESP and they were also able to free themselves of earthly forces in order to create giant objects and seemingly lift them from one place to another. Actually, they were disassembling and reassembling the atoms and molecules, and through this one simple method, we have the giant heads on Easter Island, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, and many other remnants of a far greater civilization than we know today. Now, the book goes on to go into even more detail at the origin of man, the wonderful beginnings of Atlantis and Lemuria. It reminds me very much of Dolores Cannon and her discussions of Atlantis. But there was one chapter I also wanted to read called Those Biblical Angels, where the guides discuss who and what the angels actually were. She goes on to write that let us pause at this point to take stock of what has gone before. It is obvious that the prehistoric world of which the guides speak bears little resemblance to our own. Climatically or geographically, they stress that numerous earth cataclysms have occurred in the millions of years before and after the advent of Homo sapiens, including many polar shifts. Modern scientists have concluded that 700,000 years ago, the North Magnetic Pole was in Antarctica and will eventually return there. Rocks whose magnetic polarity is the opposite of the polarity of the Earth's field were discovered in India, France, and Japan between 1855 and 1929. In the early 1960s, the United States Geological Survey reported on large rock samples gathered from all over the world which demonstrate nine reversals of magnetic polarity at the same time. During the past three and a half million years, even today our magnetic North Pole is not in the same location as the true North Pole. During the Golden Age of Lemuria and Atlantis, those two great land masses comprise substantial parts of what are now the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, respectively, although they were not occupying the same relative positions in relation to the northern and southern hemispheres as today. Little of our American continents and present-day Europe were then above sea level, and mountains were virtually non-existent until the shifting of the axis that sank Lemuria, folding other lands like pieces of paper crumpled in the hand. In Alaska, gold is mined out of the muck that consists of a frozen mass of prehistoric animals and trees. And F.C. Hibben of the University of New Mexico says there is ample evidence that at least some of this was deposited under catastrophic conditions since mammal remains, a tropical mammal, is dismembered condition have been discovered in great heaps. Bodies of other mammoths with flesh, skin, and hair intact have been dug from the frozen ground of northern Siberia and since the flesh is still edible, it is proof that these great beasts were frozen instantaneously before putrefaction could have occurred. O'Hare of Zurich published a classical work in the 1860s on the fossil plants of the Arctic, identifying the remains of forests and groves of subtropical plants in an area that is now in continuous polar night six months of the year. Dr. Emmanuel 
Vykovsky and Earth in Upheaval reports that in the Arctic Ocean's polar circle, there are enormous quantities of mammoth remains, including rhinoceros and the bones and tusks of elephants. And he points out that since these members of the elephant family require huge quantities of vegetation to eat every day, they could not possibly have existed in today's climate where there is no vegetation. Obviously, Alaska and northern Siberia once were hot. To complicate the mystery, there is scientific evidence that equatorial Brazil and equatorial Africa once were covered by ice several thousand feet thick. In order to comprehend these startling changes which so drastically altered the climates of different areas, I began toying with the world globe. By revolving in various directions and tilting it until Australia lay at the equator, adjoining Antarctica was in the temperate zone. The Gobi and the Sahara deserts could indeed have been highly fertile regions since both were removed from frigid areas or burning tropics. In the Arctic Circle, where the remains of dinosaurs, fig, and magnolia trees and tropical coral have been unearthed, came to position in the tropics. Thus, if our Earth was tilted onto its side some 50,000 years ago, and the Atlanteans did indeed have flying machines, it is easy to see how they could have photographed the contours of Greenland and Antarctica, those ancient rise maps again, when both were free of ice. Sediment found beneath layers of Earth as well as in ocean deeps proved that vast areas of our land masses were once underwater and an unknown amount of the ocean floor was formerly dry land. The guides describe only three of the countless numbers of cataclysms that our spinning earth has undergone. The sinking of Lemuria around 48,000 BC, the destruction of a large part of Atlantis in approximately 28,000 BC, and its final sinking some 12,000 years ago. If we accept the world of the guides in Edgar Cayce, that the biblical flood coincided with the second of those cataclysms 30,000 years ago, then obviously the Old Testament recounts events of much greater antiquity than historians presently assume. In the 19th century, Bishop James Usher packaged all civilization into a neat theological box by declaring that man was created in 4004 BC, six days after God began work on the entire universe. With modern dating methods, we know that Homo sapiens that Homo sapiens have been striding the earth for several million years, and that our globe is but a fly speck in the vastness of the cosmos. The guides make no claims to the exactness of their dating, repeatedly stressing that earth time has little meaning in the realm of spirit, but with apologies for possible errors, they state that man made his advent on earth, the Adams and Eves, approximately four million years ago. Amelius in light androgynous form several millions years earlier and the things many millions of years before that. It is to be hoped that if and when archaeologists dig up the fossilized remains of one of those beings, they will not conclude that it is the missing link or common ancestor of Homo sapiens and the ape or bird or fish. Until the spades of science began digging into the soil of Asia Minor a century ago, the Old Testament was virtually our only source of knowledge about those ancient peoples and towns. A hundred years later, we are still in the nursery stage of archaeology. But with modern dating methods, each new discovery seems further to draw back the curtains of time. A University of Pennsylvania expedition uncovered thousands of texts written 5,500 years ago at the site of a chief temple of Nippur in Mesopotamia. A half century ago, Leonard Woodley unearthed the remains of 74 richly garbed courtesans who lived 4,500 years ago in biblical Ur, the birthplace of Abraham. Skeletons of the women were adorned with headdresses of carnelian, lapis lazuli, silver and gold, cascades of beads, and artistic earrings. At a tell in Palestine, the 3,200-year-old skeleton of a Canaanite woman was luxuriously ornamented with 500 gold and carnelian beads, a silver breastplate, and electrum pins. Within easy reach lay ivory bottles for unguent, an ivory spoon, perfume, cosmetic boxes, and numerous other accoutrements in bronze Do these suggest primitive people at the dawn of biblical history. Let us see what the guides have to say about those colorful characters who enliven the pages of Genesis and Exodus. 
The Hebrews were Semites of the Middle East, but according to the Akashic records, they were originally an admixture of Caucasians with Lemurians who first came to Asia and Africa during the final warnings to leave their imperiled continent. They had a few hundred years to settle themselves before the final sinking of Mu, but they were homesick, restless, and seeking until they wandered into Asia Minor and found land that would support sheep raising, for they brought with them from Mu a love of sheep and yak and knew how to spin yarn. Apparently the yak were left behind in the Gobi country where they flourished in Tibet after the Himalayas were raised because no further mention was made of them. The guides say that after the demise of Mu, these particular Lemurians became nomadic shepherds wandering through the land intermingling with the white race and spreading the gospel of the one God. But some 40,000 years ago, finding little response to their teachings, they swore among themselves to preserve their ancient heritage by forbidding intermarriage with other tribes who were idolatrous. Next referring to the biblical flood, which coincided with the partial destruction of Atlantis 30,000 years ago, they declared Noah had indeed been saved from the resultant waters, but so had countless others. Although many thousand did perish in the Middle East and millions in Atlantis, it was actually Noah who founded the separate Semitic race and his direct line of descent produced Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and David, all progenitors of Jesus who became the Christ. Touching briefly on Abraham's celebrated journey from Ur, the guide said, as he passed through Syria, the patriarch kept watch over the sheep and other animals in his keeping and told his faithful followers, in such manner the Almighty Yahweh watches over each of us. On arriving in Canaan, he felt prompting from the spirit world to stop there and look about him. Suddenly a man appeared before him and affirmed, this will be the land of your people forevermore. Abraham, in amazement, asked how such a thing could be when they had no homeland, and the man who was actually an angel told him, Thy seed will be planted here, and it will develop into a mighty race. Abraham, an old man who had no progeny, felt this was a parable, but in the years to come he indeed sired two sons. The second son seemed to him pure Lemurian. According to the tradition of the great land and the other such melding of other races that Abraham felt more drawn to the Lemurian one, who was Isaac. Ishmael, the first son, fathered the Arab nation, and Isaac's seed, through his second son, Jacob, begat the Jewish people. It is important to realize that in those times the land was so harsh, they had to keep moving to feed their sheep and themselves. Thus they roamed, and although patriarch Abraham by then had vast holdings, yet it was held not by right of primogenitor, but by squabbling with others who claimed the land as rightfully their own. The Jewish descendants of Abraham were not always a chosen people, the account continued but become a special people through their preservation of the Lemurian law of one and their reverence for the true God. Through this special faith, rather than from piety or helpfulness to their neighbors, they attracted the special attention of the spirit world, which tried to help them in their lonely pursuit of a homeland. Thus angels did occasionally visit certain leaders, prophets of the wandering Jews, and assist in returning them to the promised homeland after the long exile in Egypt. Ever it is thus that those who preserve the spark and kindle the flame will be helped from the other side as you term the next stage of eternal life. According to the guides, Moses was a Lemurian who reincarnated to the Hebrews in order to help rescue them from Egyptian bondage. Joseph was also a Lemurian, as were many prophets of the Old Testament renowned for they saw the need to protect these faithful ones from the paganism into which so much of the world descended after Atlantis disappeared. Job, in a previous life, had been an Atlantean who resisted pressures of office by holding fast to the concept of one God. And when he again met evil ways in Asia Minor, he repulsed every opportunity to slander his God. Those Jews who fell astray during the long trek of Exodus from Egypt to Canaan were Atlanteans who had also slipped in that previous life. Descendant genetically of Lemurians and Caucasians, yes, but reincarnations of Atlanteans who forgot their worship during the period when science was God. They had returned to the Semitic race to undo the karmic stain, and they held firm to their worship of the one God whenever Moses was with them, but stumbled without his constant leadership. Thus, it is that we genetically descend from a race we have chosen in order to overcome hurdles and face temptations Although our soul itself knows no racial or geographical strain, in spirit we are androgynous souls without color, race, or creed. Spirit and soul, for nearly 20 years since my interest in the psychic fields was first awakened, 
I'd been seeking to learn the difference between soul and spirit. Neither in books nor at seminars could I find a satisfactory explanation until it occurred to me to ask the guides. This is their fascinating explanation. Soul is personality, ego, the personal you. Spirit is the force from which we draw our spiritual being, and it may be drawn from various sources, both more and less advanced than we would consider our own soul or ego to be. When a baby enters as flesh, the soul that decides to occupy that form is one that has, through previous incarnation, formed a personality in certain patterns of behavior, so that it knows what course it wishes to pursue in the physical life ahead. The spirit then is drawn to that soul, and the soul harmonizes itself with the spirit or God force, so that it will improve in the path ahead. Everyone would draw only the very highest spirit if possible, yet each is permitted to use only the etheric spirit that harmonizes with his own stage of spiritual development. Spirit is the essence of God, and although everything in God is perfect, yet the spirit emanations, having been separated in effect from the total whole since man first drew breath, are of varying degrees of order, so that as the soul seeks reunion with the Creator, so does the spirit essence. The guides promised to elaborate on this explanation at another time, and a few days later they wrote, The soul is the being we know as I. The personality, memories, and uniqueness are the I. It is that which reincarnates again and again until eventually it will hopefully reunite with the Creator as a part of the divinity. The Spirit is the essence of the Creator which is ever-present and uplifting. We draw from various places this essence called Spirit, so that when we separate to re-inhabit flesh, we draw from this limitless fund of Spirit to clothe our being, this etheric substance that resides in and with us and upon which we draw our spiritual growth. Thus, we may be linked with other souls through the same substance of spirit upon which we draw throughout our earthly habitation. It is the essence of God and the higher stuff of our being. Some call it the oversoul, inspiring us to lift ourselves above mundane physical things and strive for perfection. Jesus called it the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, and without it, we would revert to animalism in the flesh. Thank God for the Spirit. Inasmuch as the guides had insisted that angels appeared in person to Abraham and some other Old Testament personages, I asked for an explanation of the difference between archangels, angels, and guardian angels. Never at a loss for words, they affably discussed each category by turns. Beginning, the archangels of whom we earlier wrote were never incarnated on the physical plane. Not once have they strayed from God's will and they are so perfectly attuned to his being, they are as one with him and speak with his authority. They live, Ruth, and are more real than anything you have ever touched, smelled, or glimpsed. They reign over large segments of the firmament and are always on tap for the slightest prayer. They send angels to allay fears and smooth the rocky paths, and although these angels are not winged beings with floating garments, they are the embodiment of truth and light and are more real than the souls clothed in flesh around you. Some of these angels have tried earth living, and after blameless lives lived closely with God's wishes have felt no further need to return. They meld with souls in trouble and assist in smoothing out the rough edges. They are there in times of danger and suffering and grief, and are ministering night and day to all who require their services. But it would be better for those in flesh to live according the precepts of God's word and rely less on angels and their fellow men, for each of us is a separate entity, a separate planet, and each should be capable to complete a physical life cycle without leaning on others and calling so often for help. There is a divine path, and once we put our feet upon that path, we no longer find ourselves floundering, restless, and pleading for someone to pull us from the mire. Find that path through meditation and prayer. Know yourself as Christ put it. Heed the words of Jesus as transcribed in the New Testament and heed the truth set down by other great beings who have set the world aflame in their pursuit of God. The angels that are called guardian by some people are in actuality the disembodied spirits of those who have been in flesh and who on this side devote themselves to helping others avoid evil and sudden death. They are good souls of generous nature. Although they do not have the supreme advancements of angels and archangels, some of those so-called guardian angels pass on spiritual knowledge and ideas for inventions that have been generated here to those in flesh while in sleeping or half-waking states. 
Einstein is a superb example of a receiving station who was so attuned to universal laws that he was able to, during short naps, to receive the material dispensed from this side. Let us next consider those who unwittingly receive information from this side that may not have been intended specifically for them, such as those receiving plots for novels or ideas for a needed invention. Many pick up this material simultaneously, as your patent office can attest. These are sensitives who unknowingly are receiving ideas from here they would merely call inspiration. All are welcome to make use of this material if it is used for the general welfare and not for malignant purposes. The guides then summarize the three categories of angels writing. Archangels are directors of various sections of God universe, each with assigned tasks to represent the Most High in the day-to-day -day crises besetting man. Angels are ethereal beings, many of whom have never incarnated into flesh, who assist in the overall design for the advancement of man, beast, fowl, plant, and mineral into a perfect state through their combined efforts. Guardian angels are those who nearly always have been in the flesh and who wish to assist in the advancement of humans still in physical form. The Archangel Michael, one of the reigning princes under the Creator, is of such immense value to our understanding of the hierarchy of heaven that we will speak of him at length. He is the brother of the Christ, yet we emphasize that all of us are brothers and fellow creations of God, and although many of us have strayed from the original path of enlightenment, yet are we nearer to God than we are to our own hands and feet and heart. Michael is one of those who never erred, and so important are his functions, he has never tempted to incarnate in physical form. He stands at the threshold, yet is able to communicate with those who seek God in physical form. He is the tone bearer, as Lucifer once was the light bearer, and Christ the soul of God in human form. Each is necessary to the functioning of a perfect universe. And when Lucifer fell from grace, an important gap existed in the divine plan. Thus sin entered into a flawless plan, and we who would help God to fill that void created by the transgression of Lucifer should weigh carefully our thoughts and actions so that with all of us combining in good works and loving demeanor, this void will be filled by the body of mankind. Reading these words after the morning session, I was staggered by the implications. Many of us appeal to God when we are in need of help. But here were the guides saying that God equally needs our help in overcoming the void left by Lucifer's defection. Apparently, they wanted me to absorb this message thoroughly because three months elapsed before the guides returned to the subject, writing, The archangels are not here to rule or direct, but to help those who are in need of the Creator's assurance and goodness. So that if one calls on God, the archangels are instantly altered. Thus, the contact is made and the necessity of intercession is weighed by the archangels. These are magnificent beings, each with his own allotted realm, and because they are the think tanks of our realm, we know them as superior beings. When we face the prospect of an endless succession of lives in the flesh, we realize the importance of becoming more like the angels and archangels, who are so completely aware of God's will that they manifest it automatically at all times and in all places. We too would become as angels were we to listen to that still small voice of God, which is within each of us and then turn automatically to it our conscious before reaching any decision and making any move. There it is for all of us to hear or feel or sense, yet how often it is ignored while our minds lead us down the primrose path. Here on this side of the open door, we automatically know the right move to make, the right thought to think. We are in essence of God and have no worldly temptations to ensnare us, as do those in physical form. Here we have an awareness of how greatly we have put ourselves out of direct contact with the Creator by willful acts and thoughtless deeds while in the flesh. Thus, instead of enjoying the realm of pure, unselfish love into which we would so happily have been admitted, we remain here to relearn the same lessons we have been taught again and again between earthly lives while in the spirit realm. See the point, Ruth? Learn it there and respond to it so automatically that these aeons of atonement and relearning of old lessons are not necessary. Learn it so well that it becomes automatic, like repeating the multiplication tables. Respond so automatically that there is no hesitation between that which is true and that which is false, the right and wrong. Do only that which is helpful and loving and scorn that which is backhanded and unfeeling. 
In their discussion of the hierarchy of heaven, the guides seem to have strayed rather far afield from the lot of physical man in the earth. I therefore ask them to fill in the gap between the final sinking of Atlantis around 10,000 BC and the beginnings of recorded history, and they said there was not too much to tell about that bleak period. Some descended to near savagery, they lamented. After the leadership of the two great continents was gone, transportation again was of a primitive type, and the Atlantic Ocean was virtually unnavigable because of the mud and debris. Floods and earthquakes had destroyed most of the records, and isolated peoples gradually forgot the old ways of reading and writing. Even correct pronunciation and grammatical construction were forgotten as generation after countless generation lacked teaching priests and spiritual leadership. The physical world had drastically altered, and except for a few pockets like India, Egypt, and Peru, people were cut off from the once free-flowing fountains of learning. They became depressed and superstitious. Few understood the purpose for which they were born or the way to progress. It was a sad age, comparable in some degree to the later Dark Ages of Europe when the curtain was again drawn across education and understanding. They said the art of manufacturing was also lost because the secrets pertaining to the use of crystals had never been shared. Atlantis with any other nation. Some of the people remembered how to combine copper with tin to make bronze, but without sophisticated machinery, most implements were now fashioned from stone. This was the age when animals were domesticated to do the heavy work they wrote, because the things had virtually disappeared thanks to the success of Atlanteans and Rata in removing their appendages and controlling breeding so that fewer and fewer malformations appeared in each succeeding generation. Their disappearance was somewhat similar to the freeing of slaves in the 18th and 19th centuries in that a free workforce vanished. When men and women were forced to do the manual labor themselves, they found so much work for their hands that there was little time to cultivate the minds. This period is no more interesting to scholars than the Dark Ages of Europe, for people had stopped advancing or merely marking time or retrogressing. The guide said that after several millennia of this prehistoric Dark Age, the particularly fortunate blending of ancient Lemurians with whites in Asia Minor triggered a rebirth in learning. Ancient documents were re-examined and the cuneiform texts restudied and imitated. Byblos became a seat of learning, as did Athens and other areas bordering the Mediterranean. Egyptians had never quenched the torch but had hugged it closely to themselves, and when biblical people returned to Palestine from Egypt, some of them took a fluttering of that flame. Alexander the Great spread the light of learning with his conquering armies. Athens flared brightly. Rome gradually rose, then fell. History books recorded the rest. Once it was all recorded, but how sparse is our knowledge of those ancient times thanks to moronic priests who in the name of religion destroyed the tablets so carefully preserved for so many millennia in Peru and the Yucatan, who ordered book burnings during the Middle Ages and even in 15th century Florence. Sadly, the guides predict that vast quantities of today's records will similarly vanish when the earth shifts on its axis at the close of this century. This prediction and theory that the guides of Ruth Montgomery would always talk about at the millennium, we would go through a pole shift, did not happen, which may undercut some of their accuracy. But whenever you're looking at entities of any sort, human or spiritual, that are giving prophecies, they're only able to give you probabilities. And fortunately, we were able to avoid any major pole shifts that were discussed. But I do find this particular reading very resonant, feels accurate, feels true. I'm super fascinated by our prehistory. People say, well, we would have records of it. We would see advanced civilizations, but not if the poles shifted. That means a lot of what we're searching for is deep in the ocean. And you see how hard it is for them to look at ruins and remains in Egypt. They have to dust and take the sand out. Can you imagine stuff at the bottom of the ocean? It would be impossible. And we are nowhere near having the ability to properly document the oceans in a way to confirm the existence of Lemuria or Atlantis. But I always love to read guides and channeled messages that talk about these histories and to get different perspectives. This is coming from the Akashic through the guides of Ruth Montgomery. We will definitely return to this book 
because there's amazing information on Atlantis. But I wanted to at least start with that. There's so many other books that Ruth Montgomery has written that I can't wait to share with you. There's so many other books in general and so little time, but I promise we're going to get to every single one of them. As long as you stay with the reality revolution, you can follow me on my journey to greater understanding of our history, our past and our future in the new earth. We are creating our realities. We've been doing it since the beginning of time and we're learning about it every second of every day through the resonant writings of masters in the past and channeled messages in the present. There's so much information, I cannot wait to share it with you. In any case, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.